Welcome to the Security Plus Objectives for Biometric Systems, Establishing Physical Access Security and Controls, Securing Different Types of Peripherals and Computer Components, and Ultimately Securing Storage Devices. First section is Biometric Systems, so let's go ahead and get started fingerprint readers. Um, certainly permanent ones that get hooked to a wall, but then add on, for example, laptops and something like that. And also another thing that you should remember here is that you're going to have to authenticate very uh, several, I'm sorry, you're going to have to enroll several times during the enrollment period. Um, and that's to ensure that the, the signature that's in the database is uh, the most accurate. So you'll be asked to put your thumb one, two, maybe even three times. Then you'll ask to be put your, your index finger one, two, maybe three times. So it has a variety of things to compare. Um, think of it like confirming a pin. They ask you to do it twice to ensure that you did in fact do the, the right one. Okay, so that was biometric systems. Now let's talk about physical access security. You want to be able to identify the risks associated with physical access to systems. So keep a physical security point of view for this section here. All right, so physical access security protects things like data. For example, um, in a corporate setting, we don't put the servers in a place where just anyone can walk by and access them. They're typically in their own secure facility with separate authentication systems to that. But physical access controls can protect data. They also can protect employees. Okay, um, When an employee authenticates to a building and gets authorized to access that building, um, you can audit it and you can monitor who is being authenticated and authorized within a facility. So there's a level of protection there as well. There's also power resources. We are consuming more and more power every single day. And so you need to make sure that uh, power supplies, uh, all, um, uninterruptible power supplies, um, hard drives, uh, power supplies, everything have the proper power. And also you need to make sure that they have clean power. So you may have to use things like line conditioners or UPSs, all in an attempt to regulate clean and consistent power without interference. Interference from things like electromagnetical interference or radio frequency interference. So physical access security will certainly protect power. Next, you got utility lines. Again, we are consuming more and more power. And for example, you wouldn't want anybody to access physical uh, utility lines from a physical security point of view. So keep that in mind, whether it be the service wires, distribution points, transformers, all of that stuff uh, can go very, very wrong if accessed improperly. You have equipment in general, okay? Um, whether it be a laptop, with a device locked to it, or it's a regular computer with a case lock to prevent people from taking out the memory or the hard drive. Either way, there's certain uh, physical security controls to protect against equipment. All of this should be taken in, into consideration. And of course, there's the facility itself. Who can access the parking garage? Who can access the first floor, the third floor, the fifth floor? Uh, what about uh, cable rooms? Um, uh, also, wiring closets, data centers, um, certain building, or, I'm sorry, certain rooms within the building. All of that should be controlled. And you do that, for example, with the biometric authentications, or it could be just a physical lock, it could be a door lock, or it could be a card reader or card swiper. This is to make sure that you control the where the employees are accessing um, the building and an attempt to put in the controls on where they access will allow you to monitor, audit, and make sure people are doing what they're supposed to be doing and not violating the security policy. So there's certainly several different types of protection mechanisms to make sure that people or employees are doing what they're supposed to be doing. You have security guards. Security guards are great because they have human interpretation. They can monitor and watch things. But the downside of security guards is if that if you sit them still for long enough, they, they tend to get a little uh, routine in their behavior. In other words, um, when their mind is not active, um, they tend to miss certain things. So you got to make sure that you put them on rotating schedules 
and uh, give them different types of things to do during their shifts so that they're not just uh, you know, listening to their iPod and not paying attention. Also, they can monitor the usage of ID, badge, uh, ID badges. They can watch several different parts of the facility at one time using closed circuit television or security cameras. You want to make sure that wherever you are, you have the appropriate lighting. For example, it could be a parking lot. It could be a hallway or a corridor or uh, the, the rear of a building. Having the correct lighting adds a natural deterrence and possibly detection uh, to your environmental controls. Also, locks. Locks are great protection me mechanism. And then fences. These are great for perimeter controls. And you have different types of fencing. You have fencing that can act as an intrusion detection system. And then you have fencing um, that will not only be able to detect an intruder, but also notify perhaps a guard station or, or turn on lights or maybe even call a third-party facility system to go ahead and send one out and monitor the intrusion. Also, there are physical barriers. Things to include would be man traps, uh, turnstiles, or any sort of physical access control at the perimeter. Next, let's look at locks. These are your standard locks, preset locks, but there's a couple different types. You have door delay. This is when an alarm is triggered if the door does not close in a certain period of time. Be fluent with that. You have a key override system. This is a code for emergency use. Like for example, fire departments, they may be able to have access to the key override system to shut off the fire alarm in the event of a false positive. You've got master key ring. Just think of this as a way for management to either change access codes and or other features or be able to access several parts of the building with one code, like as a master key. And also a hostage alarm. This is uh, an option to have a duress code. And you see this in the movies all the time. But basically, you're entering a code, but that code is really saying, I'm in trouble. Next, you have man traps. Man traps is a great perimeter um, detection control that will prevent piggybacking and that's because a one person is allowed to go through at a time and they have to close the first door and open the second door and while the second door is open the first door is locked so no one can piggyback and gain access you know uh, fences whether it be at external to a facility or even in a large warehouse uh, for example um, there are, I've been in a couple different warehouses where they get all their shipping and receiving and all of the, the equipment that should be under lock and key actually is protected by a fenced area. So it can work internally as well. And then, of course, interior and exterior lights. These act as a natural deterrence and could be used to not only deter people from doing something under the cover of darkness, but also detect something being done under the cover of darkness. Okay, so let's look at examining logging and surveillance best practices. Surveillance. So you got security guards, you got guard dogs, and you got cameras. Be familiar, be, be fluent with, and familiar with uh, the pros and cons of each of these. Now let's just hit a couple real quick. Security guards, you have, best part about it is that you have human decision making at hand. Okay. The bad part is, is that if they stay stagnant or stand still for a long period of time, they tend to miss things. Guard dogs, they're loyal. They make a great detection system. They have sight and they have smell. Um, but you have to train them and you have to maintain them. And they're certainly a, a little cheaper to maintain than the salary of a security guard. And then you have surveillance cameras. Well, your guard dogs aren't going to use the surveillance cameras, but your security guards will. Security guards can monitor several different parts of a building at one time, and that acts as a, a great control because it keeps them active. Next, you got different type of, types of logging mechanisms. Every time you swipe your card, well, that should be auditable, and you should be able to review that information. And you have to have enough information in the logs to be able to track down the event. So just having something like successful authentication in a log file 
that's not going to really do you too much unless you just want to count the total number of successes or failures. You need to have enough information in your log files to be able to track down the user. In other words, what user ID what it, was it? What was the location that they accessed? What was the time? Um, and perhaps a few other convenient things that you should put in your log files. I would say that the best way to find out what you should have in your log files is probably to turn on is all of the features, do a sampling of that data, and then find out what fields uh, were produced in those log fi files that are, that are relevant to uh, tracking someone down. So you need to be able to answer the question of who, what, when, where, why, and how from your log files. And there's, depending on which system you use, many systems are going to have their own proprietary log format. In other words, does it start with username and then date? Or perhaps another vendor might start with date and then username. So you're going to have to determine them on a case-by-case -case basis. But nonetheless, you need enough details in the log files to successfully track down uh, the person in question or the item of interest. Also, you got security guard logs. All visitors must sign in. This is a good detective control in the sense that you're getting someone to put down their signatures so at, a, for example, a, uh, an entry point or the front desk of a building so that way you can track who's been coming and going. Now, you got to watch out for people that don't take this serious. You may do a random audit of your visitor log and find out that Mickey Mouse has signed in. Well, you need to be able to track Mickey Mouse down to make sure that you can... Um, elaborate on the appropriate use of the sign-in log. And those types of scenarios have uh, certainly happened in the past. Some people don't take it serious. They don't think that you're, you know, you're looking because uh, they don't see the presence of equipment that could be used um, or, or disclosed at a later time. So watch out for hardware disposal, especially when it comes to degaussing or destroying. And printed document security. This would include things like like recycling, shredding your paper, or or using uh, bins with locks on them rather than just throwing them right into the trash. Okay. Um, also, when it comes to protecting hard drives, you can add in certain registry settings. For example, there's a well-known Windows registry setting uh, in current control uh, current control set services the USB store and you can change those values from a three to four to disable USB for example um, but that would be quite a pain to go do that manually uh, on every single laptop so what you do is you set this through a group policy object and as that computer inherits that policy object from the domain settings it will restrict things like USB also, monitoring privacy. You, again, encryption is going to be the way to go there. Laptops, lock them down or lock them up. Hardware disposal, think of things like, you know, whatever your, your, you know, your hardware is that you need to dispose of. You know, discs, tape, cartridges, tapes, things like that. And again, with printed document security. Okay, monitoring privacy. There's all sorts of ways that you can do it. First and foremost, you need to make sure that you have a policy, standards and procedures and, gu and guidelines that you're using to go ahead and set these policies because you can't single people out when you want to monitor them. You can monitor all people and look for anomalies, but people have to be aware of that that is in, in fact what's happening. There's all sorts of add-on security that you can add on to a computer that will also monitor privacy. Like for example, you could monitor keystrokes, you could monitor via screenshots, you could monitor mouse movements, and you could even have that stuff emailed to you so that you can play the day's activity, for example, of screenshots of a computer, like a movie. So if you were to see, for example, someone working at home and their screenshot was the same thing every single day, that means that they probably weren't working. Or let's say that you saw the game Free Cell being played a thousand and one times during the day. That means that you're paying your employees to basically play Free Cell at home. So being able to not only detect but correct those anomalies is really